Correct. So what we discussed last time are we didn't actually finish the applications of uh, possible applications of groups. So I think uh, we were discussing applications to mathematics, right? So lecture number two, uh, applications to mathematics, we're discussing applications to topology and differential geometry, right? And I'm just going to quickly uh, review what I said last time in this topic. So in topology, we, I said that there are these groups called the homotopy groups. And I think they were introduced in mathematics by Hopf. And homotopy groups are essentially maps from the N sphere into some space. It's, it can be uh, some shape. It doesn't have to be exactly a manifold, but yeah. So these are topological invariants, these groups. And what are they? They're equivalence classes of maps. So uh, for example, suppose we have some space, uh, say M, such that it has a hole in it. So the, the thing in the middle is not part of the space, okay? And you are looking at all the maps from say S1 into this space, okay? And that group is going to be called pi one. So there you can have all possible embeddings of S1 in this space, right? So for example, this one, this one. Now the thing is that this embedding of S1, this first embedding of S1 and the second embedding of S1 are homotopic to each other because you can continuously deform one to the other. So they will form one element in the homotopic group and they will actually form the identity element of the, of the homotopic group. You might say, what is a group action? The group action is basically going to be composing circles, okay? So if this is an element, this is an element, and then, you know, if they, uh, you know, uh, so essentially uh, the composition uh, of these two elements is the composition. But see that there are, you know, embeddings of the circle in the space, which are say going around the hole. And the blue one can never be deformed into the red ones, right? Whatever, but the blue one can be deformed into say this one. So the blue, so, you know, embeddings of the circle in this space form a different equivalence class of, uh, of maps. And then what if you actually, you know, go around this thing twice? Here, you know, sorry, it's, uh, the autocorrect is not. So here, you know, we are not, there's no intersection here, by the way. So then, you know, we see that we can embed the circle in the space in such a way that the circle can go around twice once we go around once in space. So we say that that map has winding two, a winding number of two. And so we see that if we now uh, give an orientation to the winding, we can have you know, positive winding number and negative winding number. So for this particular space, qualitatively, I can say that I can uh, label all the maps by integers, okay? So therefore, you know, this is going to be, uh, you know, pi one for this guy is going to be isomorphic to the integers, uh, group of integers under addition. So this is kind of a neat example of group theory, which measures topology. You know, in this case, what it is measuring is that it is telling you that there is a hole in the space. So uh, if you were to 
you know, have work the work out pi one for a space like this, say n, then you see that there are only trivial elements. Everything can be uh, deformed into this point. So in that case, pi one would be just, you know, well, I like to write one, the, the identity, the trivial group. So that's going to be as an application of, of group theory to topology. And then we discussed about uh, application of group theory to uh, differential geometry. And there's one thing called the holonomy group. So the holonomy groups, uh, what they do is that they measure curvature. So, so for example, if I have a sphere and you know, if I, if I say, take some closed loop around the, in the sphere and I, I uh, do a parallel propagation of a small vector around the sphere, then as I go around the, around the loop, the vector will not come back to itself. If I carry it, you know, uh, uh, you know <clears throat> parallel to itself, right? So essentially what I mean is something like this. So suppose that we have, uh, so let me be more specific about the parallel propagation. So this is the sphere and this is, uh, suppose this is some triangle on the sphere. So these are all say, uh, I don't know, geodesics or something. And I start with a small arrow, say, uh, well, let's just take the arrow like this. And I parallelly propagate it. What it means is that I, you know, the angle that this thing makes with this curve is always constant. So, so I, 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 I bring it here, but here I now parallelly propagate to this point. So now you see the angle is different. So it ends up like this. And now when I parallelly propagate it like this, then, you know, it ends up somewhere here, right? So we see that the, 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 the vector has rotated. Now, because it's a two sphere, the vector can at most rotate by a two dimensional rotation. And we'll see that group is called SO2. So, so what I'm trying to, what we, what we can say is that, uh, you know, uh, the holonomic group of the sphere is SO2. So this is, you know, this basically is measuring the, all the possible curvatures that this uh, the sphere can have. Now, in contrast, suppose we want to measure the holonomic group of a torus. Now, the torus we can, you know, you know, a flat torus can be written, it can be expressed in this way, right? You basically take a a square sheet of paper and you identify the opposite ends, right? Now, in this case, if you take, say this is just a flat space, right? So if you take a, a loop, you know, which goes around itself, you know, it should be clear because that's what we do in flat space. You know, if I uh, parallelly propagate this vector along this loop, it's going to come back to itself. So for the, you know, for the, uh, for the torus, the holonomy group is actually identity. And that is telling us that the torus actually is a flat object. So this is one way of how group theory uh, classifies. I'm being very qualitative here. I hope you don't mind, uh, you know, to make these uh, concepts more rigorous within the context of a mathematics course actually takes uh, five or six lectures at least. So I'm not gonna go into that. But uh, yeah, the holonomy group is measures the curvature of a space. And then there are the symmetry groups. So the symmetry groups. And what the symmetry groups do is that the symmetry groups uh, 
measure the symmetry of the metric of a space. Now, in the case of this, you know, the, the holonomic group of a sphere, you know, at least intuitively it should be clear that if we kind of, you know, made the sphere a little bit oblong, that would actually not change the holonomic group. Okay. It'll, you know, uh, it might change some of the details of the path, but it won't change the holonomic group of that space. But it'll change the symmetry, right? Because now, because here the sphere it was symmetric, uh, you know, under rotation around any axis, right? But here we see the sphere is no longer symmetric under rotation around any axis, but you know it's it's symmetric under rotation on this axis. And you know the symmetry around the other axis have been sort of broken down to some discrete symmetry. So um, so essentially that means that the sphere S two, you know, as we the round sphere, when we say the round sphere, what we mean is the sphere with a given kind of metric, a given way of measuring distance, and the round sphere has. Uh, you know, it's invariant under all the rotation. So the SO3, which is the group of rotations in three dimension, is a symmetric group of the round sphere. And when we do the closer construction and go to Lie groups, we will see that the sphere can actually be written as a, as, as a quotient space of SO3 and one with subgroups, okay? So these are, you know, and, this has an extension. This idea has an extension in classifying the symmetries of, you know, uh, higher dimensional manifolds. Okay, higher dimensional, say, uh, usually it's compact, but you know they're called symmetric spaces. So this is basically in one uh, point, kind of telling you what the important applications are of uh, group theory in mathematics. Group theory has an infinitely more uh, number of applications in mathematics. So this is just scratching the surface. Okay, any questions so far? Sir, is SO2 the rotational symmetry in two dimension? Uh, no, SO2 is the rotational symmetry in two dimension. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, any other questions? <laughs> 